Ah, Hollywood. When they're not making disgustingly out of touch, self-aggrandizing political speeches at rigged ceremonies where they basically reward each other for being the best at pretending things, literally minutes after they were gloriously mocked for doing that very same thing, they enjoy nothing better than chasing a good trend. Because, you know, making good original content for purely artistic reasons and allowing it to stand on its own merits regardless of what's currently considered cool isn't how Tinseltown operates. That's the magic of cinema, folks. Whenever a movie or TV show puts on its big boy pants and somehow manages to muscle its way past the doorman and into the warm glow of success tavern, it's not long before a jostling crowd of lesser imitators try to follow in its wake, each of them eager to chug down that sweet beer of advertising revenue and awkwardly flirt with the hot barmaids of awards season. Just as the unexpected success of Star Wars inspired a slew of derivative sci-fi movies back in the 1980s, shit man, it's basically the reason Star Trek returned from the grave. So the triumph of Game of Thrones in the past few years has triggered a similar effect in TV as studios fall over themselves to find thousand page fantasy novels written by overweight bearded men with extremely slow work ethics to plaster all over our screens like a tidal wave of jizz. Over the next year, we can look forward to TV adaptations of The Lord of the Rings, The Wheel of Time, Conan the Barbarian, The Dark Tower, Shadow and Bone, and a bunch of others I don't give a shit about. The point is, everyone wants to be the next Game of Thrones. Which brings me neatly along to the topic of today's video, The Witcher, a fantasy adventure series about a monster hunter named Geralt of Rivia, based on a series of books by, uh, this guy. Now I can't say I'm too familiar with the book series, but I do know I'm a big fan of The Witcher video games. They were violent, gritty, filled with swearing and copious nudity, and laced with a dry sense of gallows humour. A bit like Christmas in the Drinker household then. Anyway, I was interested to see what they might do with a TV adaptation, whether it would manage to create a compelling yet believable fantasy world, or tumble off into madness and farce. Whether it would stay true to the dark, grim and unforgiving source material, or succumb to the recent trend of forcing woke, progressive, diversity quota politics into stories and settings that are completely inappropriate. And as it turns out, it actually does a bit of everything. Allow me to explain. So The Witcher is set in your typical medieval fantasy world of magic, monsters and mayhem. The story centres around Geralt of Rivia, a genetically enhanced monster hunter known as a Witcher. Not to be confused with an actual witch or a witch hunter, which are totally different things in this universe that just happen to share the same name. <coughs> Geralt travels from place to place as a kind of hired sword slash pest controller, killing dangerous creatures for money. He's also a bit of an asshole who treats everyone else like shit, drinks too much, takes drugs to make him stronger, beats up people who annoy him, sleeps indiscriminately with women, and basically won't get out of bed in the morning unless there's a bag of coins in it for him. It's nice to see myself reflected on screen at last. Representation matters, people. Geralt's various misadventures bring him into contact with Yennefer, a beautiful but jaded sorceress with ambitions of power, who's also trying to find a cure to the infertility that resulted from the removal of her, uh hunchbackism. I've dated worse to be honest. Geralt also becomes the protector of Ciri, a young princess with mysterious magical powers who's forced to flee when her kingdom gets conquered by an invading army led by an evil mage that used to work with Yennefer, and she spends most of the season trying to find Geralt and fulfil her destiny. It sounds simple, right? Wrong. Unfortunately, it's a bit more complex than that. See, the events in this season are shown out of sequence. Depending on the character you're following, one scene may have happened months, years, or even decades before the scene that follows it. But some characters also span multiple timelines and interact with each other at various points to set up future events. I'm gonna have to go some to make sense of this one, so hold on to your laxatives because I'm gonna dump a lot of shit in the next few minutes. <coughs> 
Syria is probably the easiest storyline to follow because it all takes place in the same time period. She's a teenage princess that's been living kind of a sheltered life in the kingdom of Sintra, protected by her grandmother Queen Calanthe. Even though she looks maybe 20 years older than Ciri, and I genuinely thought she was her mum until like the fifth episode. I guess I wasn't paying enough attention then. But then the Nilfgaard Empire invades for reasons, and there's a big battle and Sintra loses and Queen Calanthe gets badly wounded in the fighting. Motherfucker, what are you doing? There's a very logical reason why generals, monarchs and senior military commanders direct their armies from the rear. It keeps them safe so they can issue orders and reposition troops without constantly having to worry about dying. Do you have any idea how easy it is to get killed in a medieval battle? Why would you risk the fate of your entire army and nation by fighting on the front line where you could die at any moment? Also, you're a slender middle-aged woman that looks like she can barely even lift a sword. How much use do you think you'd be in a massed infantry engagement? But the script says, nah, it'll be fine. So that's good enough for me. Anyway, so Nilfgaard stormed the capital and Calanthe tells Ciri to find Geralt of Rivia for reasons. Then she gets sad and falls out a window and Ciri runs away. But she hooks up with the Fresh Prince of Rivendell and goes for a walk in a forest and wait, why the fuck are elves now black? For that matter, why are there conspicuously large numbers of ethnically diverse people in basically every scene and location when it makes absolutely no sense for a show set in a very obviously northern European climate. I mean, I could understand things like the Council of Mages drawing people from every corner of the world, but how the fuck did this guy end up working in Sintra? Or this guy? Or these people? Game of Thrones had a pretty diverse cast too, but it was done in a way that made sense in the context of the world. Black and Asian actors tended to play characters from hot, sunny countries like Dorne and Essos, because that's where people like that would naturally have evolved. But when you get to cold, dark places like Winterfell, you can guess the kind of people that have adapted to live there. They even comment on this in the later seasons, when the northerners are exposed to people of different races and they're kind of wary and curious about them. It allowed the show to cast diverse actors in an organic way that played within the rules of the world. But in The Witcher, everyone's just kind of piled in together and nobody seems to think this is strange or unusual. And if I didn't know better, I'd say this was done because the showrunners wanted diversity, but they couldn't think of a way to make it work within the limitations of the Witcher universe, so they just said fuck it and did it anyway. <laughs> So Ciri's getting chased by the Nilfgaard army because she's important to them for reasons. And every so often she'll get angry and send out a magical blast that fucks up everyone in her vicinity. Clearly she's got some kind of power that could be dangerous, but she doesn't understand its nature or limitations. Yennefer's story is probably the longest of the bunch because it spans like three decades and it's divided into two parts. The first part shows her as a crippled and deformed teenager who gets sold to a travelling mage by her abusive father. Lovely stuff, kind of reminds me of my childhood. Anyway, she's recruited against her will into a magical academy for gifted youngsters. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> Fuck off, Harry Potter. Initially, she struggles to master the force. Sorry, chaos. And fuck a doodle do, she's not just instantly better and more popular than everyone else. She struggles to learn even basic skills. She gets mocked and belittled because she looks like the fucking hunchback of Notre Dame. And she doubts her own ability. She even tries to kill herself at one point. But this kind of adversity gradually toughens her up and makes her more determined. She learns from her failures and shortcomings, slowly becoming stronger as a result. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Star Wars is dead to me. Anyway, there's plotting and scheming and everyone's spying on everyone else and people get turned into eels for some reason, but eventually Yennefer finishes her training and becomes a powerful sorceress. Mission accomplished. Skip forward 30 years and Yennefer seems to have everything she ever wanted. She's beautiful and desired by everyone and she works as a royal advisor to kings and queens. But she's bored and disenchanted with her life and when an assassination attempt results in the death of a baby in her care, she becomes preoccupied with having children of her own. The problem is that all mages are infertile so she ends up travelling the world in search of a cure of some kind. That's when she bumps into Geralt and they have a few adventures together and then they fuck, but then they're pulled apart by 
by the growing conflict with Nilfgaard. Geralt, meanwhile, is the glue that holds all of this together. The narrative generally focuses on him as he travels from place to place, meeting people and killing things. He's hired to take out some creature that's been terrorising the local population, he does some investigating and ultimately discovers the creature is less to blame for the situation than the people who created it. What's that, you devilishly insightful screenplay? Human greed, jealousy and ambition are the true monsters in this world? You're just blowing us away with originality now, aren't you? <coughs> But there's also a growing revelation of Geralt's involvement with Ciri over the years and the events that led up to the invasion by Nilfgaard. All three of these timelines eventually catch up with each other and coalesce around a big final battle to try to stop Nilfgaard invading the rest of the continent and save the world. And that's it, that's basically season one of The Witcher. So what the hell do we make of all of this? Well, I went into The Witcher expecting a solid but fairly predictable fantasy show that would deliver plenty of violence and nudity and wouldn't ask too much of its viewers. And while I was correct about the violence and the nudity part, my expectations were well and truly subverted when it came to the rest of it. The Witcher is a complex and demanding show that requires you to pay attention and retain lots of information to understand what's happening. And this is no easy task for a man with alcohol-induced brain damage. There's no hand-holding with this one, it doesn't ease you in with lots of comforting exposition and world-building in the opening episodes, you're just thrown straight into the story and expected to figure it out. And to be honest, I think that's to its detriment. It expects a little too much from the audience right off the bat, but I'll get more into that later. Firstly, I will say there are things this show does exceptionally well, starting with the characters. I was kind of unsure about Henry Cavill when he was first announced as Geralt, and the early promotional images didn't exactly fill me with confidence, but actually seeing him in action, you can tell he really gets the character. He's gruff and dismissive, he drinks too much, sleeps with prostitutes, and clearly doesn't have a problem killing people who piss him off. This is not the kind of guy who agonises over the morality of what he does, and he never indulges in pity or self-doubt. That being said, there's just enough humanity beneath it all to give him a redeeming edge. When he's hired to deal with monsters, he'll do what he can to avoid killing them. When close friends are injured or in trouble, he'll risk his life and make heavy sacrifices to help them out. He respects the value of promises and oaths, even when it works against him. In short, he's hard and ruthless, but ultimately a fair and honourable man. Yennefer is the standout of the show for me. She's more powerful than Geralt, but also more flawed and complex and human. She came from basically nothing, clawing her way up through a mixture of hard work and natural ability. But once she gets what she wants, she gradually realises that none of it really makes her happy, and perhaps it wasn't worth what she sacrificed to get there. Where have I seen this kind of character development before? She goes through a pretty remarkable journey over the course of the series, going from a naive and desperate young woman, to a powerful but unhappy sorceress, to a jaded and cynical gun for hire, searching the world for a way to cure herself, and finally, to a reluctant hero willing to sacrifice everything to help others. It's an excellent piece of characterization, and I'll give the show props for developing her into a complex, multi-layered character. Ciri, on the other hand, is fine, but kind of bland overall. She's probably the least interesting of the big three, and the script doesn't really ask that much of her. She's more of an objective that everyone's fighting over, rather than an independent character with her own agency. They obviously wanted an actress who could convey a mixture of childish innocence and adult wisdom, and I think they found a good one in Freya Allen. She's 18 in real life, but she looks way younger on screen, although she's got that weird, creepy blonde thing going on where it looks like she's got no eyebrows. Yeah! There's also Yaskier, a travelling minstrel that hooks up with Geralt and becomes a kind of reluctant friend to him. He's not one of the major players in the story, but I'm going to mention him here because he pisses me off so much. I honestly can't make up my mind whether I like this guy or absolutely hate him. Clearly he's there to give Geralt someone to play off, and although the contrast between the two characters makes for some funny scenes, fuck me they could tone him down a bit. And what really boils my piss is that he talks and acts like he just walked off the street in the present day. I know he's supposed to be the voice of the audience, but it's too much, it's too hyperactive, and it tries too hard to be funny all the time. And as we know from experience, when you have to try hard to be funny, well, you're not very funny. 
On that subject though, the show does manage to capture the dark, irreverent sense of humour from the books and games. Even during heavy dramatic moments when lives are at stake, characters still manage to toss off deadpan one-liners, providing some much needed levity. Fantasy always runs the risk of becoming pompous and silly when it takes itself too seriously, but The Witcher never falls into that trap. In terms of production value and direction, this season is... Well, mostly fine. The fight scenes are nice and brutal, although I can't help but think a few less jump cuts would have been good. Castles and cities look convincing enough, and there are some gorgeous landscape shots in the later episodes that I assume were real places. That being said, the CGI is probably a step down from Game of Thrones, especially when it comes to creature effects. That show managed to use it sparingly in its first few seasons because there really wasn't the budget for it, but The Witcher is based around killing monsters so there's really no option here. And yeah, some of them look pretty fucking fake, like the dragon and, well, whatever the fuck this thing's meant to be. Anyway, that's enough playing with my food, let's get into the real meat of this criticism. There are two major problems with The Witcher, and both of them kind of feed off each other. The first is the way in which it tells its story. I said before that the story is told in non-chronological order. In broad terms, this means we start about three quarters of the way through, then jump backwards, gradually working our way back to that original point, before going beyond it to get to the resolution. The reason for this, I guess, is to recontextualise the nature of certain characters and their relationships, gradually shedding light on events and decisions that don't seem to make much sense initially. It introduces kind of a mystery that has to be solved. Or the writers got a big old attack of the brainy fucks and wanted to show how smart they were. Unfortunately, this kind of complex storytelling requires finesse, narrative skill, experience and a keen sense of how much information the audience can retain. Fuck. It also relies on us having a good understanding of the world and the characters that live in it. Which brings me neatly along to the second big problem. The world building. See, world building is extremely important in fantasy for obvious reasons. We don't know anything about the world the story takes place in. What are the rules of this place? What kind of people live in it? How do they interact with each other? What are the major factions and nations and cities? Is there anything that happened in recent history that affects the world as it stands now? These are all important questions that need to be answered one way or another, because if you don't understand the world the story happens in, then there's no context for what's going on and it becomes impossible to get invested in it. God help me, I hate to praise Game of Thrones for anything these days, but one of the show's biggest narrative accomplishments was to establish its fictional world quickly and efficiently. Within the first few episodes of season one, most people with half a brain had a working knowledge of the major locations, factions and characters in Westeros. They understood roughly where things were, who was on which side, who was in charge and who was on the run. Because we understood the mechanics of the world and the stakes involved, we were able to quickly and easily get invested in the story. Good world building provides a way in for the audience. But this is where The Witcher really falls down. Instead of taking some time to help us understand the way things are in this world, it just kind of launches itself into the story with no preparation. Before you know it, armies are fighting and cities are burning and people are jumping out of fucking windows and none of it means anything because I don't know who any of these people are or what any of them want or why they're fighting each other. I don't know why the villains want to find Ciri, or why Ciri is sent to find Geralt, or why some elves are forced to live as outlaws, but others seem to be working alongside humans like it's totally cool. Geralt goes from place to place fighting monsters, but I don't know where he is because there's no sense of the geography of this world. He just wanders into generic villages where the weather and the buildings and the clothes all look pretty much the same. Basically what I'm saying with all this pish is that you can compromise on storytelling as long as you've got a strong and consistent world, or you can compromise on the world building if you tell a strong and compelling story, but you can't sacrifice them both and expect people to buy into it. And this is the problem that lies at the core of The Witcher. Yeah, it eventually does get its shit together and answers most of these outstanding questions, and as long as you're willing to suffer through the first few episodes, there's definitely a compelling story here. It's just that you really have to invest the time and effort to get to it, and I can't help but feel the writers have made this shit a lot harder than it needed to be. I think the show also suffers from using some of the weakest source material available. From what I understand, the first season has been cobbled together from a collection of short stories, and it shows. 
It's fragmented and confusing and badly in need of a stronger backbone to hold it all together. It feels like what it is, a backstory, establishing the characters and setting the stage for a narrative that hasn't really started yet. And that's a hell of a risky way to start off a new show. Overall then, The Witcher seems like a show with a lot of potential that hasn't really come into its own yet. A show that's holding back its best stuff for future seasons. It might be a smart move in the long term, but it's also a pretty risky gamble considering there's half a dozen other shows just like it, waiting to force their way into that tavern of success. Honestly though, I do find myself hoping the gamble pays off, because despite its many faults, I kind of like The Witcher. It's flawed and unrefined, and the heavy-handed diversity starts to grate on the nerves at times, but it captures the spirit of the characters and the world pretty effectively, and I think there's a decent show lurking beneath the confused narrative and the shoddy world building. It'll be interesting to see if it actually manages to struggle out in Season 2. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.